morning, and let me welcome you to the Crossings Church. If you happen to be a guest this morning, we want you to know that we really are glad that you're here, and we are glad that you're here because we believe that God brought you here to bless you in a way that would allow you to become a blessing to others, and that is the reality for the Crossings Church. We are people who God has blessed, but he didn't just bless us so hum- somehow that we could just be at this reservoir, you know, but instead that we could be a river of blessing that what we receive, we give to others as it flows downstream. So we are excited about what God is doing in our lives and in yours. Before we jump into the message, when someone commits to becoming a follower of Jesus, we always want to recognize that. The Bible pictures baptism as a birthing point. The Bible describes a new believer as someone who's been born again. And so the Bible says that whenever someone turns away from their life of sin to a life that is devoted to God, that the angels in heaven rejoice about that. And we want to join in that rejoicing. That's one thing, which is really cool. We got a a baby believer with us today. Uh, I know at our church, we are uh, are like a baby factory physically, you know, and we got some of the cutest babies. I was walking around this morning, and the cool thing is they're all shades and colors, but they show the incredible beauty that God has in that diversity. And it's a good thing whenever God brings a baby into the physical family, it's even a better thing when he brings them into the physical family. We want to recognize that. Also, we want to call to accountability. The truth is, you know, if I have a child, they're not going to do a lot better than I do physically. I was aware of that whenever my son at 18 years old, I was 18 years old when he was born, it was a challenge for me to go, man, that kid deserves a better dad than me. Well, the only way that could happen is if I took my walk with God seriously and became a better dad. So the same thing's true whenever... Somebody's born into the family, you know, you're going, hey, we've got a baby here. That person deserves a better brother or sister. They really do. They're innocent. They're newborns. And the only way that can happen is if all of us are aware that we don't have to be perfect, but we need to be committed to getting better. And if we do that, they're going to be just fine. So both celebration and accountability. So this last week, uh, Angel was baptized. I'm not sure about the last name. Is it Zamora? Is that how you say it? Angel Zamora? Oh, hey, I got it all right. I couldn't tell if it was an H or an M. Angel, I didn't know who this was when I brought the book up, but, uh, but when they put it here, but I saw this guy smile, and I'm really excited about having you as a member of the family. And the people that studied with you were, we always want to give you know, credit to the people who reached out to them, and that was uh, Aaron and Aaron Lancaster and Jack Walker. Where are you guys at? Jack's over here. I see him, and Aaron's right next to him. All right, so welcome to the family. Those guys will take you through that book that's designed to help you get some things down as a baby believer, and God's got some great plans for you. Welcome. Give your brother a round of applause. All right, inside of your worship bulletin, there is a set of notes and some other cool stuff, by the way. As you pull your notes out, you can follow along. There's an announcement for our Nerf War, which is really a cool thing. I think we ought to do an adult version of that at some point. Uh, Also, check the back of the bulletin. We've got our men's retreat coming up, a phenomenal time that's there, and just some really awesome stuff. But for now, the notes inside of your bulletin are what we really want to talk about as we are in a series on the theme of our year to be continued. When we were thinking about what our theme for the year should be, and every year we try to get something that will propel us to be a little bit more like Christ in the way that we are with our behaviors, our attitudes, and and maybe a little bit more like the results that Christ could bring about if we trusted him. So as we went into this year, knowing this would be a year that we would be building a new building next door to us, and that then in the same year we would again begin to select the next city where we would plant our church and send out 20 or 30 of our members, we thought about the book of Acts which is a book in the Bible that tells the story. It is literally the Acts of the Apostles, is what most uh, Bibles, if you look at it's the Acts of the Apostles. It's the story of what the 12 men who Jesus trained did in changing their world. And it is nothing less than revolutionary. It is nothing more than mind-boggling to think about where they started and where they ended up. And so as we were looking at this year, we thought, man, there's a lot of things we need to do. There's a lot of tough situations we're facing, but we want to end up with a story like those first century Christians did, those apostles in that first century church. That's told in the book of Acts, and it goes from a handful of people to a culture-changing group of people over a period of time. In Acts 28, that story ends, but God wants to continue that story in O'Fallon, in St. Charles County, and he wants to use us to continue the story of the amazing things that God could do. So this morning, we've been doing, before today, we've done nine lessons on the kingdom of God, which is the theme before Jesus died, he spent 40 days talking about the kingdom. 
the Apostle Paul, in our theme verse, it says, for the last two years of his life, the last verse of the book of Acts, he spent two years teaching them about the kingdom. So we did some lessons on the kingdom and what it means to be a follower of the king, what it means to be surrendered to Jesus as king. But the lesson we're doing today, Four Steps to Recover from a Fall, was originally going to be my first lesson in this series right after the new year. And so we're jumping in now, and I'm really thankful that God led us to do the other things because I believe they're the foundation that great things happen on understanding God and his kingdom and our role in that kingdom. But this morning we're talking about how God can help you recover from a fall. And if you've ever fallen and if you've ever failed miserably, you know sometimes getting up after you failed is one of the hardest things that you can do. In Mark chapter 14, in verse 50, the Bible says at that point, all his disciples ran away and abandoned him. Now, the specific point he's talking about happened a little more than 50 days before the book of Acts starts its story. And Jesus had spent around two years with a group of 12 men that he had hand-selected to train, and then he would go back to heaven, and he would give them this baton of sharing the message of faith in him and the message of salvation for all who would embrace him as king. So it's towards the end of that time that, that, that Jesus is arrested. It's at the end of that time whenever he goes through the most difficult time in his human life. And in the most difficult time in his human life, those who had professed loyalty to him, those that he had loved and invested in for two years, absolutely fell apart. They had a fall of epic proportions. One of them named Judas sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. The fall was so far that he was depressed, and we'll see later that he ended up committing suicide, thinking he couldn't recover from a fall, which in my opinion was not, a, not true. But it was true for him, and so he ended up ending his life. The other 10 out of the 11, one remained faithful, a guy named John, but the other 10, in one degree or another, left Jesus alone when he needed them most. And one of the guys, a guy named Peter, one of the apostles, that Jesus had specifically said, Peter, there's going to come a time when you're going to deny that you know me. He had said, I will never deny you. And Jesus said, yes, you will, and a rooster will crow, and it will remind you, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. His response was not to, the, to this very specific, by the way. If Jesus were just making it up, he'd go, yeah, like a rooster crows. But he's so specific, he says, you will deny me. You will deny me three times, and then the rooster is going to crow. You would think, okay, I've watched this guy do amazing miracles. Maybe I ought to go, oh, no, how do I prevent that from happening? His way of rather than dealing with the reality was to deny the reality. And he said, I will never deny you. And then he throws his fellow apostles under the bus and says, now these guys, these losers, and he doesn't say losers, okay, but that's the implication. These losers, they may, may deny you, but I won't. And he ended up jumping in front of the very bus that he threw them under. As he denied Jesus, using vulgarity to separate himself from him, to try to say, I don't even know who the man is. And he is left with hearing a rooster crow. And the Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. If you've ever been to that point to where you've fallen so far that you're weeping bitterly, and quite frankly, when you look at the circumstances, it doesn't look like there's most hope, much hope. As Peter looks out, he sees Jesus not being on the cross now. Jesus is now in the tomb. He's dead, and his hero is gone. All of his hope has disappeared, and he is broken. That is, until Sunday. And it's there we pick up with four ways that God can help you and I recover from a fall. And if you're here today and you haven't experienced that kind of fall, I hope you never do. But if you're like me and most of our members, you understand what it is to struggle to the point of knowing or questioning if you'll ever be able to get up and be what God wanted you to be. So let's jump into the, to the lesson and into the stories we talk about. God will help me recover from fall as I, number one, as I reflect on the validity of my faith. One of the things that you need to understand about Scripture is that the Bible says that everything good that happens in the life of a believer happens because of his faith in Jesus. 
It's not the size of your faith, but it's the size of Jesus. But faith is an assurant thing. It's believing. And so as we talk about reflecting on the validity of my faith, we need to know that, listen, this is something that is real whether you feel that way or not. You see, when we're discouraged, Satan is able to convince us that a lie is reality. And during the times that he's trying to teach us that a lie is reality, God is trying to teach us that our faith is a reality. So in Acts chapter 1, the book of Acts begins with these words. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now, as he writes this, the guy that wrote the book of Acts, inspired by God to do that, was a man named Luke. He was a physician, and he has another book in the New Testament that, if you're familiar, that is under his name. You have four stories of Jesus' life. You have Matthew, Mark, and the third is Luke. The fourth is John. But Luke is the one who's pinning this story. And he's writing it to a Roman official. Some translations say most excellent Theophilus. There's a kind of indication this guy was an officer. And we're not sure who he is. But some people believe that maybe the book of Acts, was, was, uh, as Luke did it, he was thinking about how, how it was important to record this story because Luke is a physician and it says that he records things in an orderly manner, that he investigated everything, that maybe this was going to be a book that told the history of the church in a way that even the apostle Paul, the guy who would be in prison in the end of the book of Acts, could use the facts within this book to validate how important Christianity was to the Roman Empire, that it wasn't an enemy. But regardless of whether or not he's writing Theophilus and he says, here's, here's what I, I wrote about in the book of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through his Holy Spirit to the apostles. After that, it says, after his suffering, meaning his crucifixion, after his suffering, he presented himself to them, the apostles, and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. Now, Scripture, the New Testament documents, are very clear on this reality. That if you can disprove the resurrection, you can destroy the Christian faith. There's no concept in the Scriptures that, well, even if it's not true, if you follow the Christian religion, at least you followed a good moral standard. Instead, and by the way, we'll look at this in detail on Easter in two weeks. And I want to encourage you all to come back. We're going to look at the validity of the faith based upon the resurrection. But the Apostle Paul will say, listen, if the resurrection didn't occur, Christians aren't blessed to have a better system. They're fools for believing a lie. And so Luke is writing, and as he begins this book of Acts, he's going to say, listen, the way it started is with Jesus showing himself to the apostles after the resurrection, and Luke, the physician, a meticulous man, a person who is very much aware of reality says Jesus showed himself with convincing proofs that he was alive. You see, the resurrection was a historical event. Luke was one of the very first investigative journalists, and this, these events that are recorded by Luke depict a watershed moment in the life of Peter, the guy that's going to be one of the main spokesmen in the book of Acts, and the other apostles. If you look at Peter specifically in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will find out that Peter is always close to Jesus as far as in proximity, but he often often messes up when it comes to really being or understanding what Jesus wants him to be or understand. He opens his mouth in embarrassing situations. He says things that are dumb. He even at one point says things that are so strong that he thinks is going to impress Jesus that Jesus looks at him and says, get behind me, Satan. So he's the always present but never consistent follower within that group. But what's weird is that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have several occurrences to where that's crystal clear that this guy is erratic, that he can't really be counted on to the point to where he denies Jesus and uses vulgarity while Jesus is being beaten and hung on a cross. But after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everything changes for the apostle Peter. In the stories of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which cover in the ministry of Jesus about two and a half years, there are numerous occasions where he shows his inconsistency, where he displays his arrogance or his selfishness or his whatever it might be, the weakness that keeps him being what God wants him from what Jesus wants him to be. But after the book of Acts and the recorded history, those next books from Acts to the end of the New Testament, which covers 40 years or so, 
So from books that cover two years, there's multiple failures, to books that cover 40 years. In those other books, you have one example of Peter blowing it like he did the numerous times in the preceding books, in the preceding two years. And you go, what in the world was this that made Peter go from this vacillating, inconsistent, up and down, inconsistent individual to this solid rock in the New Testament church? And the answer to that is the resurrection of Jesus and the convincing proof that Jesus was alive. In 2 Peter 1.16, Peter would write these words. He said, when we told you about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, we didn't follow any clever myths. Rather, we were eyewitnesses. He says, this stuff I'm writing you, this is not something that lacks substance. This isn't something that's going to be invalidated because people say, well, nobody saw this, the records. This is an absolute thing that we've written down in an orderly fashion. The resurrection is a historical reality. And it's a historical reality that changed the lives of all of those who embraced it. You see, the validity of Christianity hangs on on the validity of the resurrection. And Jesus welcomes that challenge. He's not afraid of that. When you had a doubter who said, I'll never believe unless I see the hand, the nail, the, the sword imprint in his side and touch his hands, Jesus was not offended, but instead, when he encountered him, opened up the investigation by saying, Do you want to see? Do you want to touch these Thomas? Peter and the James and John, that all those that begin in the book of Acts, with all of their consistency in the book of Acts, It is in contrast to what you see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the difference is the solid nature of their faith. They had watched him do miracles, but they had watched him die. And in his death and resurrection, it convinced them that he was who he said he could be, who who he said he was. And there's a natural connection that when I believe that he is who he said he is, then I can be, be who he says I can be. It takes it out of the realm of self-promotion and the ability to convince myself of positive attitude, and it puts it in the realm of faith. Because you see, Peter always failed when his faith failed. And all of your struggles and mine, all of our failures, ultimately go back to a faith issue. And when Peter's faith issue was, was settled, when it was solved, he never became perfect but he came, became consistent in a way that was incredible. He could look back no matter what anybody was saying to him, and no matter what the voice of Satan would be about you're not good enough, you know how you've blown it, you know what you did around the cross, and he would be reassured by the validity of his faith. It was the validity displayed in the resurrection. It was a faith that was full of power. It was the validity that was displayed in the cross, a faith of grace. So when you look at what they learned between the Jesus' death and their taking off in Acts chapter 1, it was that God is incredibly, the faith that we embrace says, this is a God of second chances. This is a God that no matter how many times that you fail, no matter how many times you struggle, if you'll turn back to him, if you'll give yourself to him again, he will open you with welcome arms. And it won't be simply a pat on the back of you poor, unfortunate soul. I'm glad you're back. Go sit on the sidelines. Because it's also a faith of power. To where in the next chapter, when Carrie is speaking next week, it'll be this guy that failed the most miserable. He is the most miserable living failure of the, resu- of, of the crucifixion times. And he will become the most vocal success as God exalts him to a place to be used by him. You see... It is the validity of a faith that overcomes the world. In 1 John 5, 4, the Bible says, here's the the victory that overcomes the world. It's your faith. You see, Peter couldn't overcome the world. He couldn't even overcome his own securities until he was confident that I live a valid faith. So if you're a struggler, if you have troubles falling down, if you have fallen so far that you don't think you can get up, I understand. I have lived where that is. But there is something that is greater than your fall. And that's the power of God and the authenticity of the faith that says, you are always welcome back, and I can always make you to be what I want you to be. You see, the book of Acts is a story of a smelly, a fishy-smelling, 
constantly struggling, no sensational person, group of people that are changing the world. If you look at them in the Gospels, you see them as students of Rabbi Jesus. And if you dig a little deeper, you'll find out they're students of Rabbi Jesus because the other rabbis had rejected them. And God takes the rejects and he changes the world. And you see, that's really whether you realize that or not. When you became a believer in Jesus, if you have surrendered your life to him, that's what God wants to do in your life. You were never designed to be set on a shelf to where you're sort of a trinket into the collections of things that God has saved, but you were to be actively used to make a difference. And that's really what the Crossing Church is all about. If you struggle with thinking you can never be more, if you've fallen and you think you get up, reflect on the validity of the faith. It's not about your feelings. You may feel like you're too far gone. You may feel like you can't get back up. But the cross of Jesus and the resurrection of Christ says both the grace and the power is available for you. So God will help me recover from a fall as I reflect on the validity of my faith. Secondly, as I expect Jesus to work in me before I expect him to work through me. You see, we all want to have a purpose in life. We all want to have something that matters, but often we expect God to work through us, but we've really not allowed him to work in us. We expect him to use us to change others when those others look at us as unchanged. So as Luke continues to write in the second half of verse 3, it says that he appeared to them over a period of days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Now just when you read that, if you're not familiar with what the kingdom is, you may have this idea of the kingdom of God. You may have this kind of curious idea of what is the kingdom of God. And then you go, well, in other places it's called the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? And then you start thinking, well, I know what is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. That's some place that we go to after we die. Some place far, far away in a galaxy, you know, and, and you get into this kind of someday somewhere. But over the last eight weeks or nine weeks or so, we've examined to see that the kingdom of God is not a place you go to, but instead in Jesus' vernacular, the people, the kingdom of God, are simply the people who have surrendered to the rule in the reign of Jesus. That in the scripture, that the terms kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven are used interchangeably through the Gospels. Matthew will tell a story about Jesus doing something, and he will say, the kingdom, of or the kingdom of heaven is like, and it'll say this. Then Mark will use and tell the same story, but he will say the kingdom of God is like that, and that happens several times. So when you hear those two things, you need to know the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are used interchangeably, and up until the end of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of Jesus, right, all through the Old Testament, the kingdom is always pictured as something that is to come. It's going to be here someday. It's going to be here. In the Old Testament, it gives you an idea that it's a long way off. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it starts off with John the Baptist saying, hey, you need to get ready. You need to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus says the same thing. So those are synonymously used, but then after the book of Acts, the kingdom is always pictured as something that is currently here. And so I want you to add to those synonyms, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the church of Jesus Christ. That's the church of Jesus Christ is the kingdom of God. And the church, we're not talking about the church assembled, because Jesus told some stories today that you can go to church and you're really not in the kingdom. You can say that you're saved and you're not. You can say that you're a believer, but you don't have the, uh, a saving faith. We're not talking about the assembled church. We're about talking about the authentic church. And what I mean by that is those that are a part of the church, a part of the kingdom, have authentically surrendered themselves to Jesus and to his rule. They, they've committed to God working in him. The message of the kingdom is a message of a surrender of a heart to a superior power. And the picture is that, listen, God has incredible things that he wants to do through you, but without him, you can't do anything that's of lasting value, nothing. And so instantly we go, well, I want, to, I want to do things of lasting value, and we start focusing on doing those things, but we don't focus on where the power comes from. And becoming a part of the kingdom is the, includes the concept that I am unplugging from my power 
in order to connect with the power of God. That I am emptying myself so that God will come in and fill me. And it really was the message of Jesus for the last 40 days of his life that you can't do this alone. I can empower you, but I cannot empower you unless you surrender to me. And Peter tries over and over again to do it on his own strength. And over and over again he fails until he has this massive failing, this massive power outage that that allowed him to be aware of his need and allowed Jesus to empower him. You see, the Bible says that God opposes, opposes the proud, but he lifts up the humble. And that idea of lifting up carries with it the idea of of being empowered by God. But before he can empower you, there has to be a humility. There has to be this understanding that I can't do it on my own. That I've got to make sure, first of all, that I'm allowing God to change me. And I'm really about his purposes, that religion was never designed to be this thing that allowed me to promote myself and my interests and make me look good and make me seem significant, but it was all about exalting exalting Christ. And if you read through the stories of Jesus' life and the 12 men that he was changing, what you would find out is over and over and over again, they had a problem with that. And a very specific problem when it came to the kingdom of God. They saw the kingdom of God as something that was going to give them the ability to evict the Romans and for their, them and their people to be blessed. That when the kingdom came, one of them could sit on the right hand and one on the left, vice president and secretary of state, to Jesus, and it would show their prominence. And Jesus didn't want any of that because his idea of the kingdom was completely different than theirs. And Peter wanted to speak. And he wanted to speak authoritatively. But the problem is, it is always difficult, if not dangerous, to speak to to others of the authority of Christ when you're not yielding to the authority of Christ yourself. And you see, what Peter wanted to do to be used by God to do great things is something that Jesus always wanted him to do, but he had to allow Jesus to shape what that would look like. He allowed, he, he wants Peter to be a spokesman for him, but you can't really be a spokesman for him unless you're really for him. So God allows Peter to fall. And in his humility, as he hits bottom, God is able to lift him up and use him for incredible things. You see, the effectiveness in which, we, at which he and you and I are able to speak to others the effectiveness that we'll be able to show up, tell others effectively about the life-changing power of Jesus is not simply speak about it, but to model it. And there will come a time, next week you'll be looking at it in, in, in the sermon, when Peter will speak incredibly effectively. But it'll be after he hits bottom. And it stops becoming about Peter and what he wants, and it becomes about Jesus and what he wants. Over the last several weeks, months I've been getting together every Thursday night with a group of people that will be relaunching our Celebrate Recovery ministry after we get our building built. And I've always, for the last 30 years, I've had a lot of relationships with people that are, that are addicts and struggle. And one of, I, I just connect with that group of people. But what you find out if you've been to a 12-stop program, if you've ever studied with addictions or compulsive behaviors, you know that sometimes what you want to happen doesn't happen until you really want it. And you don't really want it until you hit bottom. And everybody's bottom is different, okay? That's a reality in life and and, and struggles with sin, all right? Everybody's bottom is different. But sometimes I've had guys say, well, I guess I just need to hit bottom. As if hitting bottom meant that all of a sudden when you hit bottom, everything's going to get better. Can I let you know that hitting bottom doesn't ensure that everything gets better? Some people live on bottom. And the reason they live on bottom is because they've hit bottom, but all they get is resentful and more determined to do it on their own. And when that happens, God does not feel an obligation to step into that situation. The significance of hitting bottom only comes from the reality of the opportunity it provides for humility. 
And so if you're struggling with, with difficulty, if you're down bottom and you're blaming people and you're angry and you're resentful, I want you to know that hitting bottom doesn't change anything. As a matter of fact, it can perpetuate more bad stuff. But if in your hitting bottom, you're awakened to the need to surrender to Jesus, to allow him to really speak to you and change the way you think and the way you feel and the way you act, then there is incredible stuff that can happen in your life. And Peter's incredible fall, combined with Jesus' resurrection, combined with 40 days of instruction about what it meant to surrender to the king, the kingdom of God, had set Peter up to understand, to embrace, and then to effectively speak the authoritative message for Jesus to others. But it started with him hearing that message himself. In Ephesians 1, verses 19 through 20, Paul wrote and said this. Let them, and he's, he's praying to, to God about this group of believers in the church at Ephesus. He's let, he says, let them see the full extent of your power that is at work in those who believe. Now again, I want you to notice that he says that there's power at work, but he specifies where. Circle, the, circle those words, in those. Because there are some of us that want good things to happen around us. And sometimes it's even with an absolutely pure motive. We want good things to happen in our marriage. We want good things to happen with our children. We think good things to happen in the relationships I have. And the motive is secure as far as it's not to do anything that's bad. But we are expecting to God to work in those things that surround us rather than inside of us personally. And God's power, he says, I want them to know the, the full extent of your power that is at work in those who believe, and may it be done according to your might and your power. Friends, it's the same power and resurrection power that he used in the anointing one to raise him from the dead. So he said the same power that was at work in the raising of the corpse of Jesus to life is the same power that God wants to raise you from the failing that you've had. Total and complete. But it's a power that only works in you. And then it can work around you. In Ephesians 4.20, Paul says this, Now to the God who can do so many awe-inspiring things, immeasurable things, things greater than you could ever ask or imagine. Now just for a moment, I want to ask you the question, what are those awe-inspiring, immeasurable things greater than you could imagine things that you would like to see God do in your life and through your life. You see, God doesn't have a problem with you wanting to see great things done in your life. He doesn't have a problem with wanting you to see great things done through your life. But right now, what would that be if you could say, God, I can't ever imagine this happening. Maybe it would be the restoration of a relationship that you thought could never be restored. Maybe it's to the spouse that you're currently married to. Maybe it's this idea that you could stop being a person that was so controlled by your addictions that you'd be able to win the respect and the admiration of your family and your kids again. Maybe it would be that God would allow you the ability to control your temper that you've never been able to control. That all those around you have had to stay back because they're afraid of the next explosion and the shrapnel and everything that's going to come with having a relationship with you. And you keep thinking, God, why do I act like that? Why do I blow up like a child? It's not what I want. But it's so much a part of you. You can't ever really imagine yet being able to respond to someone who you feel like putting you down in any other way. Here he says that that's what God specializes in. He specializes in the awe-inspiring things, the immeasurable things, things that are greater than you could even ask or imagine. But notice, he says it's through the power that's at work in us. It can't simply be about them, neither the blame or the dream. 
But it has to be about a surrender of you saying, God, Jesus, you are my king. I am subject to you, so whatever you want me to think, I'm going to think. Whatever you want me to feel, that's the feelings that I'm going to embrace, even when I don't feel them. Because this is not a matter of feeling, but it's about a faith in the grace and the power of God. And I can take the thoughts in my head captive and make them subject to you who have caught, made me captive. You see, Peter had a problem with God's view of the kingdom. He thought it was about him. And I'm not sure that Peter initially, even after the resurrection, enjoyed God's design for the kingdom. Because he thought it was going to be about Jesus coming in, taking over the kingship of Israel, kicking Roman, the Roman soldiers out, and then Peter would be able to be blessed. And yet he finds out that that's not what it's out about at all. It's about Jesus coming into the life of Peter and kicking Peter out of his own heart and taking control of Peter and using him to bless all the nations of the world, not just the Israelites. It's a, it's a radical shift of a paradigm for Peter, and I'm not sure he ever liked it, but he came to the point where he had embraced Jesus' desire to be king. King of the kingdom, but more than anything, king of Peter himself. And Peter, in embracing the goodness of the king and allowing him to take over his life, Peter becomes a trusting and trusted subject. Now, I say that to let you know, I don't always have to like, and you don't always have to like the decisions that the kings make. I've been in ministry for over 40 years, and there are times when I will see something, I will ask God to do something in the way that I think is best, and he says no and does it a completely other way. And there are times that could be with the function of what's going on within the work of the church and how it ought to go. There are times that that's been an impersonal relationship with people. It's been at times when people that I love are sick, and I want them healed instantly. I want them healed and restored, and God does not heal them instantly or at all in this life. And there are times when I don't like the decision of God. And God didn't say I have to like it. He just said I have to trust him and be subject to him. When we talk about God being able to help us recover from a fall, so much of it is the struggle with self. The feeling like that we're justified or the feeling like we're guilty and God's saying, listen, here's what I want you to trust. What I say to you to feel, I want you to feel. And what I want to say to you to do, I want you to do. And you may struggle with both, but that's going to be the aim of your life. You see, it's an internal job. He's at work in us before he's worked through us. In Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 20, Jesus is answering some of the Pharisees' questions. The Pharisees were the religious teachers. They were the elite. Some places they are described as the teachers of the law. They were the lawyers, the one who discerned the finer details of the law, and they would prosecute the people that were guilty. They had a very worldly and self-centered view of the kingdom. So some of the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? If you've had the idea that the kingdom is somewhere outside, that it's a place you go to, or it's Jesus coming back you know, to take control of the earth, you may have had that question. Can I let you know, in a lot of ways, that's a super insignificant question, number one. It's a super inaccurate way of looking at the kingdom, number two. But the Pharisees asked, when will the kingdom of God come? Jesus answered, God's kingdom is coming but not in a way that you'll be able to see with your eyes. People will not say, look, here it is, or there it is, because God's kingdom is within you. Every individual on the planet gets to decide when God's kingdom will come by the decision to let Jesus reign in their hearts and life. But before he can reign in their hearts and life, there has to be a surrender of self. If you've fallen, if you struggle, if you think that God could never pick you up, you're wrong. If you think that God could never forgive you, you're wrong. But if you think that God is going to pick you up so that you can live a self-ruled life, you're equally wrong. You see, God will help me recover from a fall when I understand the validity of my faith. It is a real life thing. And when I understand that before God is going to be able to work through me, 
I've got to surrender and let him work within me. Thirdly, God will help me recover from a fall when I connect with the people God has placed in my life. It's an amazing story of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the apostles of Jesus coming together in Acts chapter 1. And if you read through Acts chapter 1, you have a group of people that had been scattered 50 days before. Not only did they deny Jesus, not only did they leave him at his his moment of deepest need, they scattered independently, like somebody running when somebody shouts with authenticity or or sincerity. There's a bomb. Nobody picks a path. They just scatter everywhere for their own self-protection. But in Acts chapter 1, you see the scattered coming back together, fueled by the resurrection, surrender to Jesus, and you you see God doing three things in Act 1 that are ways that he connects them and restores not only them to him, but them to each other. So in Acts 1, God reveals three powerful connection tools he used then and that he'll use today. If I'm struggling and and, and I'm, I'm struggling to make it, God is going to use people in my life. And there's three ways that that happens in Acts 1. First of all, he connects me as I take on a grander purpose. He says, hey, here, one of the ways that I'm going to connect you is by having a shared purpose. And it is amazing how often throughout history that a purpose that someone values can connect them even with someone that they don't value. There's an O'Edom that says, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Ever heard that? It's a historical reality as far as wars. It's a historical reality as far as people manipulating to get what they want. But the enemy, my enemy, is my friend. It doesn't say that you like him. It doesn't say that you share anything in common with him other than your hatred for a greater enemy. But the whole idea is that we have this shared purpose. They have an enemy. I have an enemy. And so all of a sudden, we, all of a sudden we become united in that reality. In Acts chapter 1, As Jesus is leaving this earth, he tells them, it's not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority. You see, they're getting caught up in the details. He says, that's not for you to know. Don't worry about the small details, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. They're sitting around, and they're talking about the minutiae. The specific dates and the times. And if we're not careful, sometimes we can get caught up in that. It's amazing. You know, we talk about wanting to be deeper in the Scripture, and we want to know more about the Scripture. But if not, if we're not careful, we'll be deeper in the minutia, the minutia, the things that don't matter. We'll have a collection of small things and miss the big things. It's exactly what the Pharisees did. So when you want to go deeper, you got to make sure that you're going deeper on the things that really matter. And the apostles are at stake of missing the mission the mission by focusing on the minutia. And I'd like to tell you that's something that stopped in the first century, but in churches today so often we get caught up in the silly little things that we miss the great mission that we were called for. As individual believers, we get caught up in the little bitty things rather than looking at the greater mission. And the problem with little things that they don't tend to unite us. If anything, the little things tend to divide us. But again, historically, the big things pull us together. I remember years ago there was a flood that we, many of you are familiar, familiar with. In, I think it was 93 when we lived in Alton, there was a, the massive flood of 93. When you came across the Alton Bridge, you know, you have the lower road that is always underwater. You have the higher road that they, whenever the lower road, fo- uh, there are two lanes each way, each way. But when the lower road gets underwater, what do they do? They close that when they make the upper lane, let both, both, you know, east and west, I guess it would be. In the flood of 93, the upper road was under. And I remember looking at all you could see was water. But during that time, I saw a picture that somebody had took. It was a picture of a rabbit and a fox riding on the same log during the flood. Rabbits and fox are not usually peacefully coexisting together. But something bigger 
that happened around them and their need for survival allowed them to stay on that same log. Both of them seem to instinctively know that. And in the lives of the apostle, in the lives of the church, and in your life, at some point, something bigger has to take over. And Jesus says, can't you, guys, why don't you decide to live for the mission? Rather than living for you and what you want, the minutia, why don't you decide that eternity matters more than that and there is something incredibly uniting about having a common purpose. And he connects us with the people who have that. We can get caught up in looking for answers. So much so caught up in looking for answers that we do it at the expense. We're looking for what we don't know when what we do know was to be the compelling force in front of us anyway. God will use in Acts 1, he gets a group of people that have failed together, and he says, here's what I want you to know, you need to get back with it. Why should we get back together? We've all failed. Because there is a mission that matters, and all of a sudden you see them being pulled together. Secondly, in Acts chapter 1, he connects us, he connects me as I join together in prayer. The story of the book of Acts is a story of praying together. Read in the book of Acts and see how many times you see somebody who is praying alone. And there's a couple of instances. But when they're praying alone, you will find also that the prayer results, like Peter is praying alone. Remember in the upper room in, in the middle of the book of Acts? And he's praying alone, and, and God gives him this vision, and God, he talks with God in the vision. That's what prayer is, you know. But the prayer was designed to connect them with somebody else. The story of the book of Acts is not the, prayer, the prayers of the isolated individual. It's the prayer of the connected commission. And there is something about praying together that breaks down barriers and pulls us together. Through my 40 years of ministry, I'm guessing I have probably done 10 different series, or 10 to 12 at least different series on prayer. All of them I can look back and go, man, something good happened. We did the series praying for a change, like with a kind of idea that, man, we don't normally pray, let's pray for a change, but also praying because we want to change. We did that, 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 that don't be afraid, instead just believe, and, and there was a, a prayer theme that went with that. There was the Lord's Prayer that we went through, there was the prayer of Jabez that we went through, we went through the great prayers, all I rarely do, but I know that when I serve, when I look back over 40 years of ministry, the most powerful series on prayer the one that affected people and me more than any other is the series that we did four or five years ago called Praying Together. And for four weeks, we had regular prayer times. And even when we were praying separately, we had an emphasis on praying together, that our groups were praying at the same time. And there was amazing transformation that came together. And it was really, I look back because it was a series, at the, I'd had the series on prayer that I was going to do. I saw the emphasis in the book of Acts. The last week before the series started, I changed the name from something praying to praying together. And I set up that little month-long prayer schedule. It was not a well prayed out kind of process. You know what I'm saying? The goal Lord led me to this through many days. That wasn't it. But I looked at the church, I thought, man, God's at work. And can I let you know, it's amazing to me how often I see brothers or sisters that they're fighting with each other. They don't like each other. They're having trouble getting along. When they decide, hey, look, we're going to try praying together on a regular basis. It is amazing how many times those issues get resolved. I've watched husbands and wives who can never agree on anything other than they don't like each other. And they've tried everything, and they make a decision, listen, usually one that is counseled to them. The decision is to start praying together regularly. And they start praying together, and you see a change in that relationship. Something happens. There's something authentic about prayer, unless you're really hypocritical and hard-hearted. You don't attack people during a prayer. You're not usually praying for somebody else's better, but you're usually praying about yourself. And when somebody hears that prayer of authenticity, and they see you pleading to God for help, all of a sudden, rather than being your adversary, they see you as a fellow struggler, and they're tied with you. And there's a uniting thing with prayer. And I would encourage you to make sure that you make this commitment to praying together. The apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, the Bible says. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, James, uh, Peter, Peter John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, John, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. 
You see, what you don't see in this audience is the fragmented nature that was going on. Fifty days before Peter, as I said, had called out the other apostles, made fun of him, exalted himself, and then he disappears. They have never rectified that situation. They found out the kingdom is not going to be the throwing out of the nation of Israel. There's probably some resentment. You mean we're not going to be able to get even with, with, with Israel? And then you've got a tax collector named Matthew there that they don't really like anyway. And he's going to be a full blessing this too. And he's not going to. And there's all kinds of friction that are there. When Peter begins to speak before, at, right after we have this occurrence, he begins to speak. He doesn't speak. God does not have Peter speak in Acts chapter 1 until they had prayed together in Acts chapter 1. I don't think that's accidental. I think that if Peter would have stood up in his arrogance and he would take the lead without there being a prayer before, because I think it was probably a prayer of confession. God, please forgive us for betraying your son. And maybe it was Peter praying, God, please forgive me for having the arrogance to think that I would not do what Jesus said I would do in denying him. And God, I'm sorry. I should have never said these other guys. I should have been focused on myself and knowing how prone I was to failure, not exalting myself in pride. I'm sure it was a prayer of confession. Amazing things happen when you have an adversary, and rather than confronting them in, in anger, you pray with them in humility and confess your end of the story, your, your problems. But not only a prayer of, of confession, but a prayer of compassion. Mary had watched Jesus be brutally executed. He's gone. A mother that is heartbroken that a son so perfect could be treated so harshly, and it's all over in a bloody mess, and he's buried, and then he comes back to life. I've got my son back. What a cool thing. He's here. And 50 days later, he leaves the planet. She will never put her eyes on him physically or hear his voice again physically in this world. And she's there. And the brothers are there. It's amazing when a family goes through tragedy, how it can pull even the most person who is the most resolved not to feel for them. It will pull them into the compassion relationship. They prayed together. Then thirdly in the book of Acts, Chapter 1, he connects me when I put my past behind me. And sometimes I can never put my past behind me without the help of someone else. Grief is a weird thing. It's something that you can only go through yourself, but it's something that unless you have someone to help you, you will always go through it. And in Acts chapter 1, Peter speaks up after it says that they have been praying together. And he begins to communicate that, guys, we've got to focus on the future. The windshield in your car is much bigger than the rearview mirror for a reason. It says in those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group of numbering about 120, and said, brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas had bought a field, and there he fell headlong. His body burst open, and his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it's necessary to choose one of the men who've been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living with us. He gives them more specifications about when that should happen, but Peter's looking at a group of people that are stuck. They've fallen, they're discouraged, they don't know everything, they're un they lack understanding. And Peter, God uses him to speak up and say, listen guys, we've got to move on. We have to move on from our failures, but we also have to move on from Judah's failures, which were probably connected, because when you have somebody who's a part of your group, and they end up committing suicide in such a brutal fashion after such a ruthless action of turning Jesus over, it naturally makes you question you. What if I could have been different? Why didn't I see something with him? Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I confront him when I saw him act this way? Why didn't I console him when I saw him? And it brings all kinds of doubts that allow you 
or compel you almost to focus on your failure of the moment rather than allowing your faith to compel you to the mission that's in front of you. You see, you need people to do that. And sometimes you may not like what they say, and sometimes you will. But the story of of the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. It's a group that comes through the brokenness, and rather than staying scattered, they pull together as a unit with Jesus as the one that's their commanding officer. And then you see in Acts chapter 2, it is no accident that after they've come together so intimately and so closely that Acts chapter 2 has the church following their lead, to where it's marked with an incredible closeness and a life-changing closeness. You see, God works through people. In Acts chapter 1, He worked through Peter to speak. Fifty days before, Peter was somewhere weeping bitterly. He didn't go to the tomb, but some ladies did. They go to the empty tomb, and they see the angel there, a man, a messenger from Jesus. And the messenger tells them, you go tell the apostles and Peter that I've resurrected I think it's strange that he says the apostles and Peter, and and my summation of why he told Peter is Peter is the one who blew it the worst that was still alive. And he used not an angel, not a spiritual angel, but he used physical men and women, angels, to share the message that Jesus is looking for you, and he wants you to know he's alive. Oscar Wilde, in one of his plays, wrote the lines, Every saint has a path, and every sinner has a future, and God uses people in the church, the kingdom, to remind us of that. Because the past is too heavy a load to carry alone into the future, so he made us a part of a kingdom. And then finally, I will be able to, to recover from a fall when I become cognizant of the promises of God. When I become aware that God has made some promises. And in Acts chapter 1, God reminds the brothers and sisters of two inspiring promises that could sustain them and you and I. First of all, God promises them, God promises to empower me to live faithfully in this life. The moniker of the failure is why try again and Jesus answers that in Acts chapter 1 they gather around him and ask Lord is it this time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel he said it's not for you know the times and dates the father is set by his authority but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the world you are going to live for me and you're going to live well for me The effect that I have on you will make you be effective throughout all the world. I promise you. I'm empowering you with the Spirit. I'm connecting you with my people. I'm sending you with my word, and you'll do this. And secondly, God promises to provide me with eternal life in the next. You'll do this until I come back to get you. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. When suddenly... Two men, dressed in white, stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking at the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way as you've seen him going into heaven. He will take the kingdom of heaven, those that are ruled by the laws of heaven, the kingdom of God, those who have subject themselves to God. He will take his church and he will take us to an eternal realm with him forever. So in Acts chapter 1, those who had failed miserably to where they didn't know what tomorrow was going to be like, they now know what tomorrow is going to be like and what eternity is going to be like. And that's what God wants for you. You are never beyond the power of God to forgive you for your past and to empower you for your future. Would you bow and pray with me? Father, my prayer right now is that we would hear the words that you have recorded and it would affect a change in our lives. In Scripture, the Bible says that faith is the victory that overcomes the world. 
But in Scripture also, faith is more than just a passive belief. It is a life-changing belief. It is the alignment with the one that we believe in. And that faith plus instruction always brings about obedience. And Father, this morning I pray that everybody here will know that the goal of the message is to change them somehow. Father, the opportunity to be changed really is contained this morning in a little card that's inside their worship bulletin. And Father, I pray everybody will pull that card out right now. Father, it has a place if they're here and you can write their name and, their, and the stuff that where, where they're from, contact, inf- excuse me, contact information. But Father, more than that, it has a chance for them to connect with you and with your church. Father, if there are people here that go, man, I've, I, I've, my life has been a mess. I don't even know if I believe in Jesus. Or maybe, Father, it's for people who believed in Jesus and the greatest failures were after they came in contact with him. They can say, hey, man, I, I don't know where I'm at, but I want to know, I want to have faith. You said that faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard when someone shares it. Father, they can check out like a personal Bible study, and they can see where they are with you, and Father, they can solidify that based upon the teachings in the Scripture, knowing that you will, you will do for them what you did for the people we've talked about this morning. Father, for others, they've never surrendered their life to you. They're not a part of the kingdom. Father, they've been self-ruled, and they've never really thought they needed you. Or maybe, Father, they're just coming to that awareness. And, Father, if that's where they are, Father, they can check, I'd like to be baptized. Father, in Scripture, baptism is more than just a dunk in water. It is that death of self to trust you. It's where sins are forgiven. It's where the Holy Spirit is given. It's where we're added to the family of God. It's where we're clothed with Christ. It's where you cut away our sinful nature. Not because of something we do, but because of, Father, what you did at the cross. Father, I pray that will know that, again, being baptized is not just an external sign. It is the surrender of heart on the inside. It's a death of self. And a dunk without a death is no more valuable than job, getting off a, jumping off a high dive. For others, maybe there are issues that have, have plagued them. I mentioned, you know, Father, anger can be like that. Addiction can be like abuse in the past. I know the struggle of how the abuse of my past tends to constantly invade my present unless, present unless I'm really getting help and being aligned with you. And, Father, we have people like me and, Father, so many that that have been through abuse, Father, people who have struggled with addictions, and you have freed them. And so, God, we are a church of failures that you have brought to stability and success so that we can help others. So, Father, if somebody struggles with something, God, they can check that. Father, for everybody, though, I pray this morning that we will say, God, help me to be someone who is walking consistently and intently for you. I don't want to be someone who stays down. I want to get up, and I want to be used for your glory to make a difference in those that are around me. But I know it starts with me. So whatever you need to check, God, they can look at that, that card. They can fill that out as our worship team sings this next song, and then a final song we'll be saying that gives them a chance to drop that card in the basket. For our members, we need their card and contribution. For our guests, we ask that they keep their money, but they give you a chance by filling out that card. And we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.